Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our last day of this very important week. I would like to start our day telling you that this will be a very different day. We will have international guests. So if you'd like to hear the original audio, just press the uh, original floor. Otherwise, you'll be able to benefit from the simultaneous Simultaneous translation as we're going to have people talking here today in Portuguese, English, and Spanish. Just choose the channel that you prefer to hear. We have invited people here to talk about RPKA solutions, especially from validation perspective. We have the right validator, routinator, and fourth representatives, and also Octo RPKI. You'll be able to learn about different tools to choose the best one, the one that applies to you, and then you'll be able to choose different vendors, different manufacturers, and that will allow a much broader distribution in our technological park and our network services. Before I invite our uh, speakers, I would like to thank our sponsors, Juvelink Consultants, WC Tech Networks, Net Finders Brazil, Novatech, Editora, Solintel, For Bills Academy, Global, Netflix, FiberX, ATI Magazine and Infra News Telecom. For those who would like to get a certificate, please enroll yourself at the link that you may see down our chat. So just click on the link and an uh, email will be sent to you, which will require your confirmation and then your participation certificate will be sent to you. The link will be active until 2 p.m. After that time, the enrollment will be closed and that's it. Now I'd like to broadcast a citizen video that will be broadcasted in the three languages. Languages. This is a, a project for digital citizenship. would like to tell our citizens about the best way to make use of internet. If we help our regular users, we'll be able to minimize huge problems to decrease several internet attacks. The idea is to add information to our regular users, and your support is ideal. If you could sign this project, if you could tell that you support this initiative to our regular users, that will be amazing. You may also download the videos, just submit your logo that is free of charge. You may download the video. And this is a way to show that you really support this idea. So let's run the video, please. Bom dia, bom dia a todos. Hi there, good morning. Good morning to everyone who has joined us here today via YouTube as well. So today this event is being uh, broadcasted in three languages because we have speakers that will talk in English and some other speakers that will speak in uh, Spanish, I mean. The ripe uh, speaker, I've just uh, uh, found out that he's a Brazilian speaker. His video is in Portuguese, 
and the Latinx staff also knows kind of uh, Spanish, but don't worry, there is a translation, simultaneous translation available to make everyone's life much easier. So at nick.br videos channel, there are four transmissions. We have uh, that uh, session being broadcasted in Portuguese. So if the session is being addressed in English or in Spanish, don't worry, because you'll be able to hear that in the other two languages. The floor language, you'll be able to hear Eduardo Moreira's talking in Portuguese, but Guillermo and Carlos will be talking in Spanish, Alex in English. So don't worry, you'll be able to choose your language of preference. And then there will be another channel just in English and another one just in Spanish where everything will be translated. So there are four simultaneous videos being broadcasted at the YouTube simultaneously. Why am I emphasizing that? Because if you want to switch transmissions, just get into the nick.br videos channels. You'll be able to see all the possibilities and just choose whatever you feel uh, more comfortable with. If you think you uh, understand English well, fine, just stick to that. But if you prefer to listen everything into Portuguese, fine as well. If you started to listen into English, but then you can not follow Alex, maybe he's talking too fast, just switch channels at YouTube. Go to nick.br channel videos, you switch languages and that's all right, just follow the, v the language of your preference. The videos will be there uh, translated, they'll be available for a while, so if during the live you were listening in English, you thought that you were able to understand but not quite then you'll be able to also to listen again just go back to our YouTube channel and videos will be there saved for you well our pay Kaye. We have uh, really experts here that help with uh, each one of those validators. Our internal team has also prepared a presentation for Optum RPKI as one of the developers could not make to be here today. And that's it. That's it for today. The same as it happened the rest of the week. We have videos recorded. So the first presentation will be a recorded video. I mean, the three talks will be recorded. But our speakers, they are all here, despite they sent us videos. They are here in our internal chat. I don't know if they will be able to follow all chats, because we have one at YouTube, we have another one here at Zoom, and we have speakers that can just speak English, others that can just speak Spanish. I don't know if they will be able to follow the chat in Portuguese, because maybe Alex might not be able to follow all of the messages in Portuguese, but never mind. They are all here. We are going to get all questions at the chat. Our team will make their best to be able to follow all chats, to take, to write down your questions, your comments, translate them into English. So then after the three videos, we can get back live with all speakers to open for a discussion panel. But before I give the floor to our speakers, let us know where you are from, if you are from a provider, company or not. Interact with us over the chat. I want to know where you are. I am following two chats, one from the Portuguese video and another one from the original uh, language broadcast. Fabio, 
Is this the provider name or the Wi-Fi password? No, I'm kidding. We have people from all over the country here, the Brazilian territory. Yeah, the whole country is being represented here. Are there any foreigners here? Maybe someone from Portugal, from Angola, Mozambique, any other country which Portuguese is the official language. And let's not forget that in the afternoon session, we are going to have our virtual exhibition fair. We hope that this uh, afternoon exhibition fair will be just uh, amazing. We'll have our sponsors participating with several small lectures for uh, at the, our virtual booths. Eduardo will be there, myself, Patara, Gilberto Zorella, the PTT guys, Silvia Sirota, everyone will be talking to you, addressing different Nick.br projects. And it will be wonderful to be able to meet you there, not physically, but remotely, which does not matter. That is good as well. Well, before I start the video, please, I want some likes. I see in the original audio, 77 people following us, 190 people following us in the Portuguese audio, 100 likes in Portuguese, 50 likes in the original audio video or video audio. And please leave, let your like there to help YouTube to make the organic distribution of the video because by giving your like, will be a, the, the YouTube will know that the video is on. And send the original video to your providers, WhatsApp group. RPKI is a very hot topic. If you are not still working with that, you should. This is a very relevant topic. Here we're going to talk about RPKI validators. I mean, those are softwares that you may deploy to operate together with the routers to indeed validate uh, filters, to check, to verify RPKI filters. And here we are going to talk about the several choices available. You can even be able to choose more than one validator to allow redundancy. So let's explore all that field. Let's benefit from those guys who are responsible for the softwares, for the projects. Let's not miss this opportunity. Come on. You are not here asking to Eduardo, Tiago, on Moreiras who give the workshops. Ah, which one is the best validator? Does the validator work like this, like that? Have you uh, performed a security test? Come on, ask it to those who are the guys responsible for the projects. <laughs> So, give us your like and tell your friends, tell your pals that this will be a very interesting live session. So, let's run the first video. Good morning. How are you? My name is Philip. I am operational director for Rice RCC. As you can tell by my accent, I am Gaúcho. I come from the southern region of the country. And it's been 14 years that I moved to Europe, 14 years in Spain. And now it's been nine years that I had moved to uh, Holland. Now I'm here to talk about our RPKI validator, uh, RIPE NCC. So I'll tell you a little bit about our background and why have we decided to discontinue the development of our validator. 
So let's go back to the beginning of our time when I first started at RIPE NCC in 2012. All our framework was quite weak. Everything was kind of experimental. Our team was quite small. At the time, we would consider that to be a very experimental project. We have a... So, as I said, very experimental in the very beginning. And the use of RPKI as a technology for routing security, that was quite low at that time. Therefore, it was very important to strengthen that ecosystem. Several tools were required to make things work fine, such as RPKI validator as one of them, and the required resources made available. The first version was written in 2010. If you want to research, this is the link. Some uh, figures. In 2012, we had in the ripe NCC region, Europe, Middle East, Central Asia, and Russia, we had 789 certificates with a total of 561 ROAS, the route origin authorization. We had also a uh, authorization with the LACNIC regions with a rather limited use, 55 certificates and 52 ROAS route origin authorizations. And as far as I know, there was no one using the ROAS, no one using RPKI at that time. It was basically still an experimental project. But before I go into the details about our validators, let me tell you exactly what a validator does. To start with, a validator is a wrong terminology, as if you would call a shaver for a Gillette, and instead of calling a fridge or fridge there or things like that, you know, the proper... Uh, terminology would be relying party software. Its goal is to validate those objects which are cryptographed and codified throughout a repository. One of them is the RRDP and the other one is the resync. That software is installed at users' routers. Therefore, that has to be uh, fast, safe and cheap. This is a system which is directly installed at the system of our users. December 2011, uh, we have released our validator version, which is a rather uh, mature version of that software. There were some interesting uh, functions like a web interface. Uh, however, there were a number of issues. One of them, the high memory consumption, with a low performance level, and that was the reason why the language used, I don't know if you have heard about that scale, but I don't know if that is the best uh, tool, the Scala tool, if that is the best one to help to develop a product uh, like that. And moreover, not many people are able to develop a uh, Scala like that, and Validator is an open source project. And the number 
of uh, performance and memory with the high consumption was quite uh, low and uh, the backlogs they were of high consumption as well. May 2018, a new release, we had a new release, the there was the RIPE 76 presentation. There was a new rewriting of our validators, this time that was written in Java. And this is the language that we, lo we learned to love to hate. And we also made another mistake, which was to choose a Java classic stack for those server apps. That stack helped us to develop our portal to vendors, our register software. This is a good stack to this type of application, but not to develop this type of application. That was a mistake. There was an attempt to solve the prior version issues. Our data was transferred to a database memory and the data model was standardized, but not as we would expect. Despite all the goodwill, main problems were not solved yet. The memory consumption was still quite high, around one gigabyte. And there were several stability problems, such as crash and stuck, slow start, and also the size of uh, database kept increasing uh, to some users. There was a, a reported bug of 50 GB. Several complaints were submitted by our users and also too much difficulties to solve these issues and to re-engineer the system. Some other issues were organized to improve whatever technology stack was not improving. Hibernate was quite slow and there are some tasks that they do not work fine and the program might be somewhere around the framework so it's quite difficult to run some of those programs. Hibernate, extremely slow Misha has a link with some additional details and information. I would recommend you to click on this uh, 79 RIPE presentation, which is quite interesting. There are some lessons learned for the Hibernate deployment. So this, in a nutshell, is how things started. Let me now tell you about the RPKI step in which it really got more robust and started being used, which was quite difficult in terms of decision making. Let me tell you a little bit about that. In the beginning of 2019, we've noted we noticed an exponential growth in the use of our RPKI technology around the world. T1 providers started using route origin validation using RPKI to really filter the GBN ads. So Telia. AT&T and others started using it. So it really picked up. We also noticed a significant growth in number of certificates and ROIs being created in our system. So here we have some numbers and it's interesting to contrast against the numbers I presented before. In 2012, there were 789 certificates in the region where we work. In the beginning of 2019, the number went up to 6,500. So the number nearly doubled. And then 10,000 certificates in December same year. 
And to present, there are nearly 60,000 certificates. Very significant growth. Number of uh, growers, ROIs, we have even greater growth. We used to have 561 in 2012, beginning of 19, 7,700, significant growth already. Number same year, the number nearly doubled, 13,190. And today we've got another twofold increase, so we have over 25,000 ROIs. The whole use has really uh, meant pressure to our infrastructure. First, our PKI value data was not really performing well enough. We had just so many complaints from our users from the whole community. It got to a problem. It got to such a level that it was really very embarrassing to us. It was affecting our reputation, I have to say. At the same time, we started detecting failures in our basic infrastructure, repository and trust anchor. Everything happening about one year afterwards, in the beginning of 2020. Here, a, a list of problems we faced. It was kind of difficult. So February 24th, there was a problem of outage and a data validation issue in our repositories. Right afterwards, on March 5th, there was a problem of consistency in uh, a problem of consistency in our RRDP repository. Things were placed out of orders, and then when it got into validation, the validator didn't work. Many objects were being rejected. In the beginning of April, we had the most serious issue which was by accident the removal of 2,600 ROIs of our users. It was a problem in the registration. We just marked some legacy plugs as if they hadn't been found. They were not uh, eligible to have a certificate, and we deleted all of them. Very, very serious issue. Something that is unacceptable, of course. And right afterwards, less than a week later, there was a seven-hour outage in our R-Sync repository. And that was really what um, took us to a different level. Of course, our board started also uh, questioning us. So we created a task force to address all the different problems. So we simply stopped developing everything we were doing with uh, our PKI and said, let's solve the issues. So we focused on monitoring one of the main problems so things would get got shut down and took us some hours to realize that uh, it had happened until users sent emails or complaints. So our repository had been, hadn't been active for hours and we didn't even realize that. At the same time, we had to look a very serious understanding of the feasibility of having our PKI validated and a trust tanker. In English, in English, people say we're spreading ourselves too thin, which means we're doing a bit too much, or maybe more than we should. And we decided to maintain a validator and the, the core, the trust anchor, what, uh, was too much for us, for one team only and with the level of knowledge we had at that time. So there was a problem of lack of focus. So we just went through our existential crisis. Our NCC is not a software house. This is not our business. To develop this kind of product, we need some level of knowledge, some experience that we did not use to have at home, C++, Rust, and others. We, we did not know that. The engineers we had in a PKI database, they 
work mainly in Java, a little bit in Scala, but we had no knowledge of Rust or C++. Another important issue is that this is not our core business. We are a company that registers internet numbers. And we do some related services and related tools, CCM and others to support network operators. But this kind of tool, uh, RPKI, is not part of our core business. At the same time, the community kept on telling us that they didn't want us to make use of the resources to develop the validator. There were also a number of other products, such as Routinator, with a much higher level of maturity. Another thing that kept us awake at night was the fact that our API validator was still widely used. In October 20, we had about 28% market share. So total number of uh, calls that trust anchor just done through our tool. Finally, the decision was a given to some extent. In August, September 2020, we decided to discontinue our PKI validated and worked internally on how to do it in a okay fashion to the community. So we announced that in October 20. And this is a video where we see the announcement being made. And we also share that with the RIPE meeting. We decided to go on a phased approach to have the phase out. January 1st, we stopped developing new features, new functions. March 1st, we discontinued new RFCs and policies for RIRs. And July 1st, we discontinued fully the project. So it was the end of our API validator. The title of my presentation is focusing on, on what really matters. So what really matters to RIPE and CC? Basically, two things. Two things really matter to us. First, ensure integrity, security, and resilience of trust anchor. Second, offer RRDP and RSync repositories with high availability and low latency. So first, trust anchor resilience. To reach this goal, we have to focus on development of a control framework. We selected SOC2 Type 2 Audit Framework. And one of the reasons why you selected that is that it's widely used by tech companies in the area, Google and a number of others. It consists of a list of uh, focused controls to ensure process integrity in a very broad way throughout the company. It's not only focused on technology. Of course, it does have technology on a key point, but it goes beyond that. It was customized to the needs and focusing on RPKI. This is a general overview of what's happening in this framework. Security, network, application, firewall, encryption, detection, then availability, performance monitoring, disaster recovery, integrity of processes, which is key to us, quality assurance, for example, processing, monitoring, and others. Then comes confidentiality, which is also important. So encryption, access control. Finally, privacy. We decided to remove because in RPKI, there is no private data. 
there are only IP addresses and AS numbers. There are no user's name, for example, no private data. Let me give you some examples of how the RPKI control framework works. If you recruit someone new to work in your team, so when you run background checks, criminal records, if it's someone who has that in the market, something like that. If it's someone who has that, someone it's a person who might be more subject to bribing. Then control policies for access to HSM keys. That's another example, a password policy. There were a number of controls put in place. Based on this list of controls, so we carried out a gap analysis, comparing the control list to our internal processes to really know what we were doing and just try to identify gaps. Based on that, we identified a list of control gaps which were missing. And all these gaps have to be compensated. Otherwise, we cannot have appropriate audit by an independent external auditing company and come up with a SOX 2 type of report, producing a SOC 3 report, which can be published externally, which is the confirmation of an independent auditing saying that RIPE NCC is really complying with all the due controls. The second equally important issue was repository availability. Repositories are the externally visible portion of Trust Anchor, which is used in real time to define validity of BGP announce. When we are not available, it may cause operations in internet operation. Therefore, it has to be highly available. So our internal targets five nines, 99.999% availability, a maximum of five minute downtime per year, and low latency, a low response time. And to do that, we need horizontal scalability with geographic distribution. So the repository in Brazil and the one located in the Netherlands Yes, it will take some time to travel around until it gets to the end. So it means higher latency. Therefore, we need servers closer by if we want to keep low latency. It also requires good monitoring and 24 by 7 support and good quality control. So this is what we thought as being the requirements. In terms of horizontal scalability, to present our RRDP server is provided in the only AWS server. It's not the ideal situation. Of course, we are much better now than when we started that. We are much more stable, of course, but we are still not at the optimal situation. Anything we do now is going to be better than what it used to be anyway. We've updated our code so that we can have multiple instances of repositories, not only adding more servers in AWS, but having independent instances and having both of them running at the same time. Right now, we have in development the migration to servers located in Amsterdam, which are managed by us. We have Agronex data centers located in two different areas of town, Science Park and Sudus. We want to maintain the AWS instance. With the new architecture, we can have both. 
Equinix and AWS, both being updated simultaneously, but one of them gets traffic. So Equinix will become the main one. If there is any problem in uh, DNS, we can have a carryover and simply uh, guide it to AWS. And we have low KPL, like one minute. So very quickly, there is a diversion of flow and it goes into AWS. As there is a relatively low number of servers, we can use CDN to increase performance and reduce latency. In the future, and that's the next step of our project, probably next year, then we are going to consider how we can further improve the situation. Probably we're going to add more servers to our different instances. Maybe we can use bare metal as a service. And then we are going to review whether we are going to use CDN or not, and what to do with AWS. We can either keep it or expand horizontally. Maybe we won't need CDN or a secondary station, or maybe we can have something independent as well to replace AWS. Now let me talk about other interesting projects we have in place. Something that we do regularly are internal security audits. We had a red team testing, which is really something interesting. I don't know if you know it. It is a team that tries to break down your system, not through coding necessarily, but trying to have access to the data center, to the different points, trying social engineering, customer service uh, attempts. So a number of uh, tests to make sure that the system can really sustain a very interesting exercise. And uh, nobody knows exactly when it's going to be done. Maybe I'll, I'll be in the office, someone from the red team just shows up and uh, starts running tests. I'm quite curious to see the results of this exercise. We've hired a company to do it for us, and uh, we'll see what we can disclose with the market later. Of course, once they identify security failures, we will, we'll of course, close them before disclosing to the market, of course. In addition, we've been working on open source of our PKI core. So the validator is open source, but not the core. And that will uh, require detecting what would have to be sensitive and not become open. So we are uh, reviewing it, and it has been done throughout the year, but it was still uh, coming to the final analysis. Finally, we are also working on what we call publication as a service. It's interesting if you have delegated RPKI using Krill, but um, you don't want to have a repository and deal with all of that. Everything that I've said before, if you have your own repository, you have to be concerned about a number of other items. So what we are providing as a service, uh, run you run your own Krill, but then when it comes to publication, you use our repository. This is something that we've been uh, using and analyzing. So thank you very much. I am going now to, well, I'm available here in the chat and I'm also going to be here for the Q&A uh, session. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for listening. Nós que agradecemos a oportunidade de ter esse We vídeo are the ones to thank you with this uh, recorded video explaining about the uh, ripe validator and that might be this 
uh, interrupted, discontinued, and maybe just to keep it for validation. Now I'm going to go to invite a route nader. They are going to talk about uh, pres past, present, and future. And then next, how to deploy them at our devices and then how to operate. So let's run the first part of the video, please. Hi, my name is Alex Band and I work at Enelmet Labs. And I would like to tell you a little bit about the history of Routinator, where we are now, and where we're going with the application. Enelmet Labs was founded in 1999 with a mission to develop open source software to support core internet infrastructure, as well as doing short and long term research projects. Historically, we're best known for our DNS software, such as the recursive resolver Unbound. But about three years ago, we ventured into making software for BGP routing as well. Part of this was the development of Routinator, which we kicked off in the summer of 2018. At the time, there was really only one actively developed implementation, the RIPE NCC RPKI validator. And we felt it would be good for the community to have a little bit more diversity in the tooling. And because this was a completely greenfield project without any prior code or any legacy, we could just make a couple of big decisions on how we wanted to build it. And one of those choices was the programming language that we wanted to write it in. Being a classic C language shop since 1999, we asked ourselves if this would be the right language for a project to start in 2018. And after some deliberation and prototyping, we decided that the Rust programming language would be the right fit for us. Rust is a systems programming language that is really, really fast and memory efficient, with no runtime and no garbage collection. Rust also guarantees memory safety and threat safety, eliminating some of the most common problems with C. And looking back, we couldn't be happier with our choice. The language itself has matured and improved in many ways over the last years, allowing us to rewrite parts of Routinator to make it faster and even more efficient. The ecosystem around Rust is also really thriving, with the language making its way into a robust TLS library, NTP, curl, and even the Linux kernel. So after a couple of months of prototyping and beta testing, the first release of Routinator was done in February of 2019. It was a very basic release that could run as a service, fetch RPKI data via rsync, and serve the validated data to routers via the RTR protocol. We were very proud and of how lean and small we were able to make the application, which could run effortlessly on a Raspberry Pi Zero. And quite quickly after that, we added an HTTP server to Routinator, so we could offer a Prometheus monitoring endpoint. And we soon realized this, this was actually very useful for other purposes as well, as it could also serve all of the validated ROAs on various endpoints, as well as offering an API. We then added our RDP support, which made the whole package quite complete and mature. We long resisted adding a web interface to Routinator because doing a user interface and user interaction is a really separate skill and an art form. And we weren't really comfortable with doing that. But however, because our other RPKI project, Krill, definitely needed a user interface, we got some external help how to tackle this. And with the experience gained and after hiring additional developers, we're now in a position to create something for the latest release of Routinator that we're really quite proud of. The user interface is a standalone open source application that can run on any server and just needs to be able to talk to the Routinator API. That way, the Routinator core can stay as lean as ever. The journey to bring Routinator to where it is now is actually quite magical, and we're really proud of it. We've been able to build something that stays true to our values and our mission. Free, open source, liberally licensed, and for the good of the internet community. We were able to grow the team dedicated to routing security from two to six people currently. And this makes sure that we have all of the specific domain knowledge in-house, ranging from cryptography to BGP routing, and ensures that the project doesn't hinge on a single person alone, as is often the case with open source projects. 
And all of this is thanks to the financial support of the industry, which consists of donations to our foundation, support contracts for our software, as well as features that are paid for by specific organizations who need them. And this makes the foundation of our open source development model completely sustainable, which isn't always that easy, but it's very rewarding if you see it working out. So I also want to take the opportunity to thank all of the organizations who support us. So what's next for Routinator and RPKI? Well, currently RPKI provides. Um, so what's next for Routinator and RPKI? Well, currently RPKI only provides root origin validation, but there are quite some interesting developments in the IETF in order to offer path validation as well in a more lightweight form than full-on BGP sec. And one of the promising proposals is ASPA, allowing operators to publish statements about their provider ASNs. And I really think this would be a nice addition to Routinator to support this. And lastly, I think the Brazilian community is setting a really good example for the world with their delegated RPKI deployment model with Krill, allowing organization to publish ROAS with NICPR. Based on the success of this model, APNIC is now also offering RPKI publication services as a service. And Aaron has this in development, and the Ripe NCC has it on their roadmap. And as experience grows, we'll just continue to build an internet that is more secure for everyone. Bom, pessoal, agora a gente viu aí o, o vídeo falando um pouquinho do passado. Well, we had a chance to hear about the past, the present and the future. Now we'll be able to see the deployment. That's a very short video, 15 minutes, and that lasted for eight hours during the infrastructure week. Now with Alex Benz, someone who is a developer, everything goes so fast. And while it took us eight hours, he can explain that in just 15 minutes. Let's now run Alex uh, band video with the deployment instructions. Welcome to this demo of Routinator, RPKI relying party software written by Nelnet Labs in the Rust programming language. In this demo, I'll be walking you through the installation of Routinator and setting up a basic configuration. After this, I'll walk you through the user interface and we'll set up monitoring. Routinator is a full-featured package that is designed to run as a service. It periodically fetches certificates and root origin authorizations from the global RPKI repositories and rigorously validates everything for integrity and authenticity. It then exposes the verified statements about route origins via the RTR protocol to your routers, as well as some useful formats such as JSON and CSV. There's also an API you can talk to, as well as a user interface and Prometheus monitoring endpoints. Getting started with Routinator is really easy. We provide binary packages for Debian and Ubuntu, as well as Red Hat Enterprise Linux, CentOS, and Rocky Linux. You can also run with Docker or build Routinator using Cargo, the package manager for Rust. When choosing a system to run Routinator on, make sure that you have one gigabyte of available memory and about four gigabytes of available disk space. This will give you enough margin to grow as the repositories get bigger over time. Because RPKI validators fetch data via HTTPS and rsync, you need to make sure that your firewall allows outgoing connections on ports 443 and 873. For this demo, I'll be using a Debian 10 virtual machine with an x86 architecture running with two cores and two gigabytes of RAM. I'll be showing you how to install Routinator using a binary package for Debian and Ubuntu, as that is the most common method used. There are a number of additional things you can do to run Routinator, such as creating a separate user, but I'm going to go for the most basic installation that you can adjust for your own specific environment. All of the binary packages are available in the Enelnet Lab software package repository. To add it, I'm going to add a line specifically for Debian 10 Buster to etc apt sources.list. Note that we also support Debian 9 Stretch and Debian 11 Bullseye, as well as release candidates through the proposed channel. 
And for Ubuntu, we currently support version 16, 18, and 20. Next, we're going to add the public key for the repository. We'll fetch the key using wget and then add it to the list of trusted keys using the apt key command. If everything works out, you'll see a confirmation with OK. And after this is done, we can do a sudo apt update to refresh the repository. With these preparations done, we can now run a sudo apt install routinator to actually install the application. The next step is to initialize Routinator by installing the Trust Anchor locator files, also known as TALs, of the five regional internet registries. Routinator comes bundled with all of the five TALs, as well as a number of testbed TALs. If all you want to do is set up Routinator for production use, you have to type Routinator init. This will present you with a message about the errand TAL. Aaron is the only RER who wants you to explicitly read and agree to their relying party agreement. You can see the URL presented here. You should open it, read the agreement, and if everything is fine, you can proceed by running Routinator in it again with the accept Aaron RPA option. So let's go ahead and install the five tiles. You can see that the command read the configuration file, created a repository directory, and installed the five tiles in its own directory. Let's run Routinator immediately and make sure that the service launches at boot using system control enable now. Let's also see if everything works properly by checking the status. Ah, great, yes, it looks like everything is running. Now you can see that Routinator is taking its configuration file from etc routinator slash routinator.conf. Let's have a look at that file. For security reasons, by default, Routinator only serves its data on localhost, so you'll have to change this so that other machines and routers can talk to it. It'll start the RTR server on port 3323 and the HTTP server on 8323. These and many other values can be changed in the configuration file. To have a look at the default options that Routinator runs with, try entering Routinator config. The documentation and the man page will give you a complete overview of all of these options and you can add them to the configuration file as needed. For now, let's just open the files and make the HTTP and RTR service available on all interfaces on both IPv4 and IPv6. To do this, I'll change 127.0.0.1 into double colon, which, at least on Linux systems, will cover all protocols. After saving the file, Let's restart Routinator to make sure that all of the changes take effect. Now, the first time Routinator runs, it'll connect to the five trust anchors and traverse the RPKI tree to fetch all certificates and ROAS from the various repositories to build up a local cache. And currently, that's about 40 repositories that contain a total of about 400 megabytes of data. The whole process should be done in about 10 minutes, but it really depends on network topology and latency. The next time, however, Routinator will only need to process the changes between what it has in the cache and what is new and changed in the repositories. By default, updates will happen every 10 minutes and they normally take about 30 seconds to complete. The easiest way to verify if Routinator has finished the initial validation is to check the status page from the HTTP server. Let's check up with curl from the command line. It looks like initial validation is still ongoing, so right now the user interface isn't available yet and nothing is being served via RTR, so routers can't connect yet. But now that Routinator is available on all interfaces, I can switch to my own computer and have a look there. So let me close my terminal window, fire up a browser, and open the domain name that I have set up for this demo on port 8323 using plain HTTP. Of course, if you would like to secure this more, you can easily set up a reverse proxy using something like Nginx and add a TLS certificate. This is a more robust solution for these purposes anyway. Instructions on how to do this is all available in the documentation. After refreshing a couple of times and maybe getting some coffee while the initial validation run completes, you'll see that the status page offers a lot of statistics about the last validation run. This includes when it started, when it finished, 
how many ROAs were processed through each trust tanker, and how many validated ROA payloads that resulted in. You'll also see detailed statistics about each RPKI repository and which connection method was used to fetch the data. Now that the status page is serving data, that also means that the user interface is available and Routinator has started serving data via RTR. Let's have a look at the UI. The user interface offers a validity checker, which is also available through the API and from the command line. You can enter any combination of AS number and prefix, and Routinator will tell you what the RPKI validity of the root is, along with an explanation. Let's enter AS12654 and the prefix 93.175.147.0/24. This is one of the ripe NCC routing beacons. These prefixes will always have a status valid, invalid, or unknown, so it's great to verify if your routing policies are working as expected. I chose an invalid prefix here, so you can see that Routinator doesn't just display the status, but also gives you the reason why. In this case, it's because the announcement is coming from an unauthorized AS number. In upcoming versions of Routinator, we will expand this user interface with additional functionality, such as adding root collector information, displaying related resources belonging to the same organization, as well as more and less specific announcements seen in BGP. You can see a preview of this functionality at routinator.nlnetlabs.nl. Everything that you can see and do in the user interface is directly fetched from the Routinator API, so you can build your own automation around it. Let me show you the same AS and prefix combination directly from the API, so you can see the JSON at the source of it. This data offers the route that you asked for, the validity state, the reason, the VRPs that caused the result, and of course the timestamp of the validation run on which the result is based. The HTTP server also has endpoints for all of the validated ROA payloads themselves, so if you want them in CSV or JSON format or even RPSL, you can easily fetch them. The last thing I want to show you is the metrics endpoint, which has statistics in Prometheus format. To demonstrate the metrics capabilities of Routinator, let's head over to another VM running Prometheus and Grafana. Routinator exposes a very comprehensive set of metrics for all trust tankers, but also for each repository. This allows you to set up detailed monitoring and alerts. Setting up a Prometheus job for Routinator is really easy. You simply have to point it at the instance in your Prometheus configuration file and restart the service. Here on my VM running Prometheus and Grafana, let's open up the Prometheus configuration file. Setting it up is really easy in this YAML file. We can just stick with the defaults for practically everything and just give the job a name and point it to our VM on port 8323. Then just save the file and restart the Prometheus service for the changes to take effect. To see if everything worked as expected, I'll open up a browser and open the Prometheus user interface and then go to the status page and from there select target. You can see Routinator is up and metrics are being fetched. Ha, great. The last thing I want to show you is setting up a Grafana dashboard. You can set this dashboard up from scratch, of course, but we also have a template that, that you can get started with. To do this, simply head over to grafana.com and search for Routinator. You can see that the dashboard ID is 11922. Copy it and head over to your Grafana instance, hit the plus icon, and then hit import and paste the ID. Adding this dashboard now will present you with a really empty and boring page, but um, this is what it'll look like yeah, after running for a week or so. You can see detailed metrics for each RPI repository, as well as statistics for all of the trust anchors. Setting up routers to fetch validated data from Routinator via the RTR protocol goes way beyond what we can show you in this demo. There's broad support from router vendors for RPKI and root origin validation, whether it's Cisco, Juniper, Nokia, Huawei, or Arista, everything is going to be covered. If you use a software solution such as BERT, FRR, or ViOS, 
you can also use RTR to connect to Routinator. To learn more about RPKI and how it helps make BGP routing more secure, make sure to read the documentation at rpki.readthedocs.io or join the RPKI community Discord server where hundreds of operators exchange experiences. Pessoal, como é que tá até agora? Vocês estão é, gostando? So far, so good. I was just distracted with the chat, but please let us know. Are you following translations? Are you just uh, following the information? Just give us a feedback, right? Are you following well the videos? Please don't be ashamed. Come on, ask your questions. We need your participation. Our team is here. Uh, and uh, our team says, how come? No questions yet? So please ask your questions. Our team is here taking notes of them. We still have got more presentations to go. And once we finish our initial round of uh, presentations, we are going to go into questions. But uh, we really need your active participation when we go into it. Let me now invite Guillermo and Carlos Martinez from LACNIC. They also recorded a video, but before showing you the video, they are going to go live just to make a brief introduction. And then we are going to run the video and they'll be back later for the Q&A. Guillermo, Carlos, we are now going to show you on the screen and then you're ready to go. Please take over. Bueno, uh, hola, ¿qué tal? Hello, everybody. How is it? How are you? I am Guillermo from LACNIC. I work in the in the LACNIC research and development area, and I'm with Carlos Martinez. Say hello. Good morning to everyone. So basically, the idea is to demonstrate how you install the fort validator. But before I start, I would like to introduce how this project was brought about and what it's all about. So I am going to share our web page. As you can see, our web page is available is has english spanish and portuguese it's called portproject.net and it is it's a joint initiative between lacnic and nic mexico to improve routing security i am not going to deep dive on this site but i would like to tell you that we don't only have a validator but we have fort monitoring that are the three parts of the project for the val the rp rpki validator the fort monitoring tool that I could we want you to see the link but this is a tool and the idea is to is to register the safety incidences or routing announces that can present a problem in the region and at last well i believe that this is from 2018 this a re this is a report of the routing incidents in the region between 2017, 2018, and part of 2019. This report, we used it as a baseline. So these are the two active parts that would be the Fort Monitoring and Fort Validator. So the Fort Validator meets all the functions that have been demonstrated. It presents its own functionalities. It is developed in C for those that have worked on this have been the people from NIC Mexico. And what we want to demonstrate now through a video 
that was produced by Alejandro Acosta and Nick. Nicolas Santonello from LACNIC ICANN, and they are going to show you what the installation process is like, which is very simple. So this is my introduction. So I think that we can proceed with the video now. So we're going to start our installation process. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Alejandro Acosta. I work for LACNIC and in development and innovation. I am very happy to have you here because this is the first course that we are going to record together with my friend Nicolas. He's from the Casa de Internet. Now he works for ICANN. So Nico, you can say hello to everybody. So good afternoon to everyone. As he said, we are going to try to install an RPKI server. So we're going to work with the Fort Validator. As all of you know, this has been developed by Mexico Nick and it's supported by LAC Nick and, and the Fort Validator because I'm, we're now going to explain what our PKI is. What we're going to do is to install a this is an open code RPKI, and it's a solution that has had a boom in the last years. And the idea is to reassure the prefixes in the routing tables in the internet world. So Nico will carry out the installation, and jointly we are going to explain exactly what we're doing. So in order to give you a background. So, Nico, you may proceed. So, Nico, thank you for sharing your screen. So, we are going to continue with the fort installation. So, I am going to connect myself to my virtual machine because this is where I have things. Here we have a virtual machine running on a virtual box that you run on, you run on Ubuntu 20.04. Here you have the operational system. And what we're going to do here is we're going to confirm that it is updated. So we already installed the actual the updates so everything is totally updated so what we're going to do is to install a number of tools that will be needed in order to compile our fort server there are a number of ways of installation but the one we selected for this demo was to unload the last stable version of the Fort Validator from the GitHub repository and to compile it in our operational system. So, yes, we're going to compile them here. This is what we're going to cover today. And then you can also have, you can add a repository in Ubuntu and use the deployment. That's uh, the alternative. But here, now, we're just going to compile. Compilation has advantages. Traditionally, it's going to be more efficient, faster. as a process when you have them compiled in the computer where the process is going to run. There you go. We've deployed the packages to compile them. And now we're simply going to connect to the GitHub repository and you'll see the last stable version. There you go. And now we'll see the directory we've just created. And uh, to compile, it's been compiled and autogen.sh. We've 
prepare the compilation and there you go. So, you first actually covered maybe whatever you had to do still in the process. If I could put it like that, yes, there you go. Here you can load and connect to GitHub and other uh, useful applications. File them. So here they're compiled. We were going to install. And make clean to clean whatever has remained from the compilation. And then here, we compiled and installed our server, our fort validator, and now we're going to create directories, directories, and the validator will then well, use them. So let's create the directory where we will find our validator slash etc slash fort. Okay, Ale, go ahead. So now, if you have a Unix-based system slash etc, that is where traditionally the configuration files are, are placed. So in fort, etc fort, you will see that in a few seconds, it's going to copy a file, a configuration file that will read the fort process when it's executed. And there you need to have the directory because when fort says execute, run, one of the parameters is whether it's the directory or the config file. Yeah, so you will view the configuration file and validator here in slash port, you have slash var slash port, you create directory tl and also repository. So, Ale, go ahead, please. Yes. In TAL, as we know, what happens with um, the RPKI world in Fort? The seed, as a term, for lack of better option, are going to do well, what Fort will do when it runs is to read TAL and place it in the repository and bring it down, whatever is downloaded in the end will be deposited in the repository slash fort slash repository. So anything to add? No, it's perfect. So now we're going to download the port validator and from GitHub. And then you'll see some transcollocators here that have been downloaded. We're going to copy them. Remember the directory where we loaded the GitHub files is the slash root slash port validator. And then in examples, TL, you have TL that are, TL that are, well, what we can do as an example is move them to the this uh, directory here. So you'll see the context in this directory slash part slash four slash tall. And here you have these examples tell that were uploaded in GitHub Slacknik because to download it you need to have the explicit approval of the use policy. Of course, it can be free and open, but you need to have okay, the okay, the green light from the system according to the policy. So we're going to authorize the TAL for the five national registries and then Fort has 
tool that we can run with this option here. Init tell. And with this tell option, we'll indicate where we want it to store the tells that will be downloaded and to store it here where these uh, the latest version so we show them they have to keep it here download it and keep it stored here so the five repositories here will be downloaded apnic was downloaded already it's trying to download this one and now i have to accept the terms so yes, then it will be downloaded here. Now it's downloading Blacknik and Ripe. Okay, there you go. And Nico, this same directory that you're working on now, slash bar slash for slash doll, I think it is contained in the configuration file that Ford is going to read when running. So in one way or another, we need to, of course, download the tiles in the directory we're working and we are going to have the configuration. You can do a copy-paste. Okay. Yeah, here you have the directory, the content, the files are here. Aaron was not included previously because we had not accepted the download policy. Okay, so everything would be ready. Now we would have to then create the configuration file and indicate that it should consider the parameters, these parameters when running the other fort server and we're going to create this config file. As Alejandro said, the estimation, well, the directory where the config file will go is slash rtc slash port. And we're going to call it config dot here. Jason, my friends who are operators critique me. They say you no longer use that. You should use something else than nano, but I like nano. <laughs> well, nobody's perfect. Here is the config file. It's created. We take the content. Alejandro, do you want to review it? Sure, the content. So here, first, you have the JSON format and the options you're mostly going to use are well, we have tal indicating where tiles are going to be placed. Where's the repository? Remember, server. We'll connect to repositories, registries, download them in bar slash for slash repository. So you can view what is happening here in this local repository. And this is very interesting, this piece here on server. You can see the directives the server will receive, the port. In the case of Nick, they're using 323. And, but we can use any other port that will interest us. But here, I want to use the port where the web server is, 443. The DNS with port 53. Maybe you have backlog, interval parameters, and when you get to interval validation, refresh, you try to expire. Remember the SOA registry. It's basically the same name. But moving on. Okay, maybe I can review some other points. This mode here, server, is telling validators that we're going to use it as a server for validation. And you will later be able to connect a router to the validation server and bring the prefixes, the prefixes that are validated. And 
modalidad de trabajo. That's why you have to use boat server and then have validation here in seconds. That's why you can use an S here. If there's no S or nothing, it's seconds always. So this means the cycle, R4, server will run a validation cycle every 15 minutes. It'll try to connect. It will download the tells again if there's uh, something that is changed it will run the validation cycle uh, run the prefix list and the routers will then read them and that happens every 15 minutes and also when you go to dot lock later on to run the server, you have this 900 again, right? The refresh. Okay, and maybe you want to talk about this line here. It's also important. Yes, very important. Thank you. So, let's bear in mind that you have this ROA concept, resource, origin, authorization, whatever fort generate for does. Well, it's going to produce this file here that ends in .csv. And we'll see the prefix and the autonomous system where this ROA was created. So, in the end, you'll see what autonomous system can announce the prefix, as we will see further on. And then you know that Ford is running correctly. So, if it's blank, that's bad news. Okay, great. So now, we keep our config file, and now we're ready to run our Ford validator. Should we run it manually, or show them how to create the service to run it, and then run it there, and show them as it runs the logs and so on? Alejandro, well, let's run it manually very quickly. This is well, to do debugging. Check that Ford for can run without any errors and correctly. So, you have the troubleshooting. Standalone, meaning if it doesn't run or doesn't start, the process will not run when you start the machine and it will require manual intervention. So, okay. So, to run it manually, so to speak, as Alejandro said, you simply, all you have to do is go here. The binary is Fort. It's located in local bin, the USR local bin, and then we are going to look at the configuration file we wanted to use, our server to use to run. So, configuration file, and we tell it to use the configuration file, which is config JSON, which was just created. We run it, and uh, well, Alejandro, any comments? Validation cycle. It seems to be configured right. No reading errors. It's running the first cycle. The first validation cycle has begun. Yes, we're using the Ford server. The service is connecting to different national registries according to the files that are assigned, and the syncing is just starting. 
this first, the first cycle. There are further cycles, 15 minutes, that Nico talked about. It's important to know that binary is okay. It was compiled correctly. The JSON file is, has been read. No errors there. The process is good. So, bear in mind, it, it's, it, it, the process ends, it's terminal, it will go away, and uh, let's hear more about that. Okay, so we can install it as a service, run it, and go through the process. Okay, fine. So, the service, well, it's not running. No, nothing running. And we're going to install it. This is not tied to installation but, per se, but we're going to create a service for this to run. Had to inform the server that we want the service to restart automatically and we don't want to have an open terminal or a process running or to start it manually. So Ubuntu is the system we're using. We're going to create the service configuration, which we'll call 4D.service. This will be placed in the repository slash lib slash system d slash system in Ubuntu. So we create the service specification file here. This uh, service specification, a brief description. Yeah, under unit, the service, we have the description. That is the name assigned to our service, the reference name that Alejandro and I just assigned, and then it's going to form the system that this service, for D that we're creating, it'll try to upload it only after, well, once the network services are, are started, once the network services are active, are running, it will start, it will begin, and then in service, service specification, you'll determine the type, simple, the working directory, in the user local bin, the exec start line, and what's key here, how I want the service to be executed, just as what we did earlier manually, and other directives, where to store the log. I create a file slash var slash log for 4D, and the same here. And this is for the messages that go to C-Log. This will be the identifier, and I have the same description. I use the same description as in unit. Waiting times, they will... What do I want to do if there is a failure and how long do I want to wait before I try to recover the service? This would be five seconds. This is a parameter that is usually used by and large. We have to put it in the service specs. And this is an alias as well of the name of the service. So the alias is going to be for div.services. Once we create the specifications, we, we put it away. And there, if there are people that are listening that don't know that uh, this runs like a div, no, the, the, the demo, 
is a process that will be run, you know, and it works according to requests. Like when you have a web server running, it's the web daemon doing. What's the web daemon demo? They are seeing the request. This is the same case. We have a daemon that is the for process that is in the TCP 8323. These are requests request of the RPKI validations and connecting in the RTR protocol tool for it. Yeah, demo, demo, demo sometimes sounds a bit scary, but no, this is, it's, I think this was the name Linux gave it. So just services would be easier, wouldn't it? So what we're going to do, we're going back. We tell the system to try to reload all of the services. And what we're going to do with this is we're, we just created a new service, Fort D dot service. We want we want we want it to take it. And this, I believe that it should have already reloaded all the services. Now we're going to use this enable in order to indicate if we restart the servers, we want this service to be enabled automatically and we want them to run the demo automatically. So what they do is to create the symbolic link in order to carry out this task through the server. Now, if now we see the status of our service, here we can see with the system control status, this is the name that we've given to our service. It's loaded. Okay, here you can see it's enabled. So if you reinitiate re the service, it will be loaded automatically, but the status is inactive. It is not running our service, our demo. And to run it, we will use system control start. And this should initiate the service. And then we see the status command to see what the status of the service is. And here we can see the green dot and the status now is active. So it's running, right? So this is, this shows you when it started, when the service started. And here we also have other parameters, like for instance, this is the running line that we have used. Remember that the log exit was taken to slash log slash 4D, if we see this log, oh, it's slash bar slash log slash 4D dot log. And we can see when we ran it manually, when we initiated the demo, we have the fourth server and we are running the first validation cycle. And here they are asking us for the first validation cycle to end in order to connect the routers because as soon as this first uh, validation cycle ends, it's going to create a CSV file that has all the prefixes, and this is what the routers read from the Ford server. I don't know if you would like to mention something while we wait for the first validation cycle to end. Really, I don't have much to add. You have shown this in detail. What was the command like? I don't know. What was the command in order to verify that a server is listening through the right port? So in the Unix world, there are thousands of ways of doing it. I use Netstat. 
space. P A N process all and non reverse because then the output would be slower. Well, we could put pipe and grep. Three, two, three. Okay. You can explain. This is a way of doing troubleshooting, and it is it, 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 it's important to know that the process is listening through the right port. So what this is showing us that they're listening to TCP connections. This OOO shows that they are listening to to these configurations, port 323, as he said, and it is listening. This is the ID of the processor, and it's on listen mode. So it's listening through the right port. If we use PS in order to visualize all of these processes, PS is process status. Yeah. And here, here we have the process ID. It is running the ID process. And this is a type of fork that generates these processes. These are processes that run in parallel in order to complete the validation cycle that it's, that it's is being executed. Well, with this will last more or less three minutes. So this is how long it takes to connect and to process that Ford has to do in the operation. And it just ended. Okay. So here, those, the routers that have RPKI configured in them, and they can carry out the correspondent processes of route validation. Did you see how long it took to the first validation cycle? It was four minutes. I think four or five minutes is a reasonable amount of time for it to complete its first validation cycle. Now, if we see our directory slash var slash fort, well, we can see that it he, well, it, for RAS.CSV was created at 420. And it uses seven and a half megas. And this is a file. This is a big file. So this is a file that has the autonomous systems and the prefixes associated to these autonomous systems that were processed and validated by our validator. Could you carry out a crep of the autonomous system 28,000, which is correspondent to the LACNIC autonomous system, which we use in order to do the announcement of our different prefixes, and we can see that our prefixes and are created in ROA, and they have configured 28,000, and here the prefix is 200.10.62.0 slash 23, and it could be announced until slash 24. So, this file, this Fort file, Fort Roas P, uh, uh, .csv has all the files that were validated. So, there is an ISP that has the autonomous system 6057. 
Here we have all the prefixes that have their roles and were correctly validated by the fourth validator. And um, there is an autonomous system. And here you can search for any autonomous system that has already had its ROA created. It is important to know this and know that exists, uh, you can do your troubleshooting if you don't create your ROAS in our RIR, and then you have to see if it's correctly set. And with Fort, this is a feasible way of doing, but when you have your own Fort, it's just a simple process. And what I did here, I visualized once again the status of our four process. For D, it's still running. We see that it completed its first validation cycle. If we visualize once again the log, what is happening now that as the cycle validations are completed, this is is indicated in the log. And here the type of validation should be 900 seconds. So we will have one validation cycle every 15 minutes. At 35, we shall receive announcement telling us that it has already completed its validation cycle. Well, I think that we're coming to an end. I believe that our installation was successful and I hope that this is of use for those that are watching the video. What hardware do you recommend to run this validator? What kind of hardware do you recommend? I'm not, uh, I don't like recommending hardware because everybody has their own preferences according to their needs. Now, what we have to bear in mind that this isn't something that consumes a lot of resources. In reality, this is running in a virtual machine in, on VirtualBox that has two two gigas of RAM and has one processor assigned. So this is a machine running on Ubuntu 20.04. I downloaded Ubuntu a little bit before this demo. So the requirements, what I'm doing with two giga of RAM and one processor, well, you really don't need a lot for this, and it doesn't consume a lot of disk space. You could see that the file that is the biggest file that is generated by the server is around 7 mega. Now, obviously, the Ford server will, will take up some memory while the validation cycle and all the files that it generates until it ends generating the CSV. There are not many requirements. I don't know. You can run it in any machine. We could even risk a recommendation that would be to install it and run it in some type of virtual environment, something that is easy to replicate or when you set and connect the routers to the server, you must bear in mind how many routers are going to be connected to the server. So if I have 10, 12, 15 routers in my network, I can have a server and connect all the routers to the same server. Now, if you have a, a bigger network and dozens of routers, well, that have to be connected and perhaps you can have a number of like two or three servers right beside the router you can specify priorities you give them the IP address and the port where the server is listening and where I want the server to connect so you 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 give priority one to, to one and you give priority two to the other. Priority one is the first one that connects. And if they cannot connect to 
one, they can connect to two, so you could have two or in three, four servers running in different machines so that you have redundancy, redundancy and to be sure that you will have high availability for your service. I don't... I can't think of much or any or anything else to recommend. So whoever is going to implement the Fort server, well, I hope that all of this information helps them. I believe that this has been a complete demo. And here, I believe that we covered up the explanation. So, Nico, I really do thank you for dedicating your time to this video. It was a pleasure. You know, I'm famous in terms of videos. I have followers and everything. So, of course... I, I, I have a video similar to this where we would simulate a route sequestration. And here, but here we, and in this video, you could see the VGP server. Rem, there is a video that it was difficult to record it because there was Linux, there was Cisco. This was the compilation. It was really complicated. You know, things were much more complicated in the past than what they are today. So I think that this was a good demo. I think that we can replicate it with Ford and FRR. So thank you very much for participating in this demo. And hello to everybody. We've just seen the video, and you've seen Alejandro and Nicolas, but we have here people to answer questions, Carlos and uh, Guillermo. Well, with that, I'd like to ask for the next video for the Octo RPKI, it's Claudifex. When we called Claudiflare, they said the person had recently left the company, the person responsible for the project. And they said, well, we are in the process of transition, training someone else to carry on the project, and we cannot send anyone live. So all of us at Nick.br decided to prepare the tutorial for you, not the developers themselves, but our team trying to teach you one more validator, so one more opportunity. So now let me ask to uh, the video to be played, Lucas and Anderson. Olá, pessoal, tudo bem? Aqui é o Lucas. Hello, everyone. Thank you. This is Lucas George, and together with Anderson, we are going to give you the tutorial for installation and setting up of Octo RPKI. This validated of RPKI developed by Cloudflare. Similarly to other validators available in the market, such as Rotinator, it has a very specific function of bringing down ROIs and information about prefaces and AS of different different RPKI uh, repositories located in the five regions, Afrinic, Arene, Apnic, Lacnic, and Ripe. And once the information is downloaded, then it places it into the router and AS so that the router knows how to check the prefaces and uh, make sure that they are valid invalid or unknown. For the tutorial, we have set up the topology that you can see on the screen. You can see in the screen. It's very easy. We have two ASs and they will give you all the scenarios necessary to see the chat. And we are going to see that here in the chat. Let's explain the topology. We see this AS22548. First, one AS is real con sus prefijos y ROAS publicados en los repositorios de RPKI 
esse, esse, esse 5 mil, que não é esse fictício, né? Que nós criamos apenas para esse tutorial. Então, o AS22548 vai fazer o envio dos seus prefixos. AS is going to send prefixes through BGP. And there, within that, we are going to install OctoRP KI so that the router can really download the information and validate whether the routes of uh, uh, AS is sending and whether they are valid routes and uh, valid prefix. To send to the router, we are going to use RTR protocol. And there you can see OctoRP. ATI and uh, Go RTR, because in validators, RTR comes embedded in the main app. But Claudio Fair decided to set it apart. So we have Octo RPKI, which downloads information of all the different repositories. And to transmit that to the routers, there is another service called Go RTR, which is also from Cardiflex. In the tutorial, we are going to install both of them, and then we are going to make the necessary uh, setup for them. In the tutorial, we are going to install as well as Grafana and show you how to use Grafana to show information about RPKI in a better, clearer way. And this is uh, what Anderson is going to do. Here we have a simple representation of the topology. And to run the config, we are going to use IFNG simulator. Topology has been set up. The hosts have the setup uh, IPs. We've closed the BGP section in between the routers of both AS machines, and they have published the prefaces here, one to the other. To install Octo RPKI, we are going to use the server, which had the Ubuntu already put in place. Let's go into the website where we have Octo RPKI, and you are going to see you have versions for different Linux. If you want to compile a code source or Linux, it's okay. There is no limitation to the operating system you are running. The first thing to do to install Octo PRKI is to go into the GitHub of Cloudflare. So GitHub slash Cloudflare slash Go Octo RPKI. This is where we have updates and changes that happen within Octo RPKI. Here we have releases. And as I am recording the video, the valid version is release 1.3.0. Well, you have to release updates because of bugs and because then you have less likelihood of having any problems. Here we have the releases, many versions for all different Linux distributions, installation with uh, code source, Windows, and as we are using Ubuntu, we are going to use installer.deb. Copy the link. I'm using a root user here. And let's create a file called Octo PKI. This is not a mandatory step, but for organization purposes, we should always have a separated file to include all the processes. And now using WCAT, we can download .dep. Download it. It's not a very large file. Now using dpkj slash i, we start the installation. Simple. If we want to make sure we have, uh, we are sure we have the updated version. Let's say you have a previous version of Octo RPKI, so you can simply run the installation as I've shown you, and it's going to overwrite uh, on an older version. So Octo RPKI one version uh, one. 
3.0. The next step before starting services per se is to download digital TAL, T A L, Trust Anchor Locator. These are text files that are going to give us the location of all RPKI repositories. Without TALs, your Octo RPKI server will not download updated information of all the ROIs that were published by AES. So we have to download these files. That can be done through the websites of each of them. But in this case, Cloudifier within your GitHub also has this digital file so you can download automatically from the website. And that's going to be quite easy. So here we have all the links. And we are going to use WGAT to download the files. As there are five of them, we are going to download five .tall files. So I've copy and pasted the command, five of them. Let's see ls minus l. So I've downloaded within Octo RPKI folder. A best practice would be to create one additional folder named TALS, and I'm going to move then the files into this uh, dedicated TALS file. All TAL files into this folder. Let's see if we have them all here. Yes, good. The five of them. Afnic, Apnic, Ari, Lacnic, and Ripe. Let's go back to Octo RPKI main file. And now that we have the location files of all RPKI repositories and we have installed Octo RPKI, now we have to download information. So we should start running the service of Octo RPKI. To do it, we need this line of command. No hub, which is a Linux command, just telling us that we are going to run the process in second stage. Octo RPKI dash output dot sign equals false is showing that we are not going to use auto identification in the site of the Cloudifair uh, Cloud website. They have the documentation of the services, and you see there there are different options for authentication. In our case, it's going to be kind of simple. We don't need that. And here, some codes for the system to in inform about output or errors into these files, out file and er file, ERR. So, here we have process number. If we want to check whether it's running, let's use PS minus AUX, pipe grab, and the number. And here we can see RPKI is running, no error. Once the service is running, we have all the installed tools, files. Now we are going to generate a JSON file where all information will be stored for ROIs and prefixes found in RPKI repository. So we are using the command curl, curl, localhost, running on door 8081, which is HTTP, tp slash output dot json, which is the json file that is going to store the information that we are going to use in RPKI repositories. File not ready yet. This is the information we get because it's still generating the JSON file. In your browser, you may also copy this link 
this URL and try to access it directly. So localhost 8081 output.json. And it's going to tell you file not ready. It takes 5 to 10 minutes to sync. And once it's initially synchronized every 20 minutes, it's going to run a new sync of the process. Of course, it's not going to take that long to show you because I've already done it. So I'm going to pause here my video, wait for the JSON to be generated, and once it's ready, we are going to resume the video. And I'm back. We've waited for the 5 to 10 minutes to have the generation of JSON. JSON files ready now. And we can see here in this website, very simple JSON validator, metadata, and ROIs. If you include the AS number or the prefix you are query, you can see exactly where it is. But as the number of ROIs is quite high, that are what? Over 200,000 prefixes. If you click here for ROIs, it's going to load all of them, and that's going to really uh, cause some delay. So I really avoid using this interface to do it. If you want to visualize the information, you can always click here, save, and download a copy of the JSON file. Another option is to click here, raw data, and it's going to show you text file JSON. And here showing all the information. You can see that it's synchronized in alphabetical order. Afrinic, ROIs. Here we can see from the other. Here's APNIC, Marine, LACNIC. So our JSON file is ready to go. So what do we need to do now? We have to collect information and just make the router have access to that. Let me remind you that we need to install GoRT, which is going to allow the router to check for information and prefixes. Let's go back to the server. And to install GoRTR, the process is very similar to the Octo RPKI. So we are going to go into the Git grub of Cloudflare. There you can see a GoRTR repository. Go and here we can uh, download the file and start that on the same file as or Octo RPKI. So let's see if it has opened appropriately. Good. And now DPKG 1 Go RTR. Very simple process once again. It's lightweighted, just like Octo RPKI. Now Go RTR version version. So point zero point fourteen point seven version. And now we have to start running the service of RTR. So let's start the service, the running of Go RTR. This command is required, quite similar to Octo RPKI. No hub, same command to run it. On second plan, Go RTR and then parameters. Dash bind is the door in which RTR is going to run. Now, in case you're using default, which is provided by the tutorial, A282, you can select a different port if you want. Dash metrics.addr. That's where you can include metrics. And that's what Anderson's going to do with Grafana running on port 8080. In older versions, it used to be 8081. But now Octo RPKI is running on 8081 and the metrics are in 8080. 
o menos verify. Minus verify equals false. Is to check and authenticate. Dash cash is exactly where the JSON file is located with the ROIs. So this is the location, HTTP, localhost, 8081, slash output.json. And just similar to the previous command, just for outputs and errors. Process running, no errors. Let's see minus PS minus X, grep 124, 312. And we can see RTR is running flawlessly. So it's done. RTR is done. Our server has all ROIs and prefixes from our PKI repositories, and it's running. The only thing missing is the router to just pull information. If you want to make sure that the ports are open, we can use net start. T L U N P. And here we can see door 80, port 8282 is running with RTR, 8080 with the matrix, and 8081 of Octo RPKI is also functional. Everything running fine. The only thing missing is to have the router pull information. Let's go now to Eve and connect router and server. Topology here. And let's make the setup of the RT router 65,000. It's open here. But before we start setting up, let's take a look at the setup, especially BGP. Let's see the routing table and see if it already has the AS22548. So let's use show IPv6 route. So this is the route learned through BGP, 2001, 12FF, slash 32, which got through gigabit 2, with the gigabit connected to AS22548. So the route has been replaced. We can see it here in the routing table. If we want to see that for BGP, we use show BGP IPv6 unicast. Here we can see the route for 2001-12 FF slash 32 through IS22548, which is its prefix. So we've already learned about the route. Now, this is our PKI validation code. V valid, I invalid, and not found. Right now, we see nothing. Why? Because there is no RPKI server connected to this router. The system does not know whether the route is valid, invalid, or unknown. Once we set up our PKI, we will see the letters here, valid, invalid, not found. So let's connect things now. Let's go into config mode, get into router BGP 65000, which is the AES number. To connect with our PKI as BGP, our PKI server, TCP, and here we have to include server address, IPv4, IPv6. In our topology, it's full IPvC. So let's have IPv6 address of the server. IPv4 would be exactly the same thing. So here we have 2001, DB8. Saka 10. 
and port exactly where the service is running. If we go back to the configuration, the port to go RTR is 8282. So let's go back to the router, 82.82, and the last parameter, refresh. Refresh will define how long it takes really to check the updates. 30 seconds. And you will see the needs in your network. How do I know the connection has taken place? So we can use show BGP. And even though we are using IPv6 to see connection with the server, we can show here BGP, IPv4, Unicast server. RPKI server. I don't know if it's a bug. I don't know how it would work. If we use that, so it shows our server, the port, how many connections were attempted, number of prefix, 276811. So it's a complete log and connectivity with the server. If we want to check the ROI tables, then we can get here, same command using table, same command use table. And you will see all networks, all prefixes that got to us in the JSON, through the JSON file, and what is the minimum prefix here and the maximum prefix. It will take a long time to see it all, so 278,000 ROIs. And this is for IPv4. For IPv6, exactly the same line of command, but showing IPv6 for IPv6, 4 for 6. And here we have the table of ROIs of all included prefix. And we can see all of them, which are part of uh, RPKI prefixes. Let's say that I want to research this AS because I want to see what is the prefix that I can see at the RPKI repository. So I'm going to use the command RPKI pipe table include 22548. And now we see AS22 with the prefix 2001-12-FF-32 and that the maximum number of prefixes at row is slash 48. So theoretically, there is a match. Let's take a look at the BGP table. We have show BGP IPv6 Unicast. The 2001-12-FF-32 prefix from the AS48 to 2548, it's a valid prefix. So there is a match with the upper information, so it makes sense that is a valid prefix to this router. So to in, uh, in installation, deployment, and setup is not so complex, and it runs smoothly. But let's say that I just want to request, I just want to check if that is a valid prefix, but no need to set up my router. No so here I have the cloudfair.com, rpki.cloudflare. And throughout your navigator, your browser, you are able to check. If I go on route validator and if I type in the prefix field, 
2001, 12FF slash 32. And then I place ASN 22548. Now that's valid expiration time in two, in two months, but with a validating route that prefix it's uh, addressed digitally and there is a ROA for this AS. Let's say that any other AS would be inputted here, 12,500. Uh, then there is an invalid message. As a matter of fact, the ROA we have is for ASN 22548. So the validation that our router is doing at the topology, it's correct. Is that all right? Now, what's next? Let's suppose that the router of 22548 can send a router which is not theirs, but that's an unknown, but not necessarily invalid. There is no ROA that will, you know, cover such a route. How are we going to do it? Router to two five four eight config and let's create an interface just to simulate a network. And let's put the following address IPv6 address two thousand one DB eight. C zero C A one slash sixty four. This is going to be the IP. Fine. And now the router will publish that network. Let's get into the config of BGP. Outer BGP to two five hundred forty eight. Family PV6. And then that will replicate that prefix and then that will replicate that prefix. Now that's the network. If we check, let's make a query here. 2001 DB8 COCA slash 64. It will show that it is a unknown prefix. It did not find any ROA that covers such a configuration, but that's invalid. It's just invalid once there is a ROA with that prefix, but with a different ASN. Let's say if our router... 65,000 got that as an unknown prefix. Same command. That is supposed to be an unknown prefix. That N means not found. So they did not find at the rowers table in the RPKI no prefix that will cover this ASN. But that's not invalid. It's just unknown. And if we query that, uh, we'll see that they add that prefix in the routing table because that's not with as invalid. Once the prefix is invalid, it does not even go to the router table by default. It ignores totally that router and does not place that in the rib, in the FIB. In the rib, but that's not placed here in the rib. Let's test it, please. Shall we? For example, vamos pegar 
For instance, let's see this 2001 network 200 slash 32. There is a row uh, to the AS 2000 and 500. If we put in the Cloudflare Fair Validator website, this prefix to this, it will show as invalid. This prefix has a published row, but that is of APNIC to the APNIC to ASN 2500. So let's try to make our AS and to see that router as if it was theirs. Shall we add another loopback? IPv6 ADD e vamos adicionar esse IP. IPv6. And let's add 200 slash 32. E dentro da configuração. And within the config of a router BGP. Vamos colocar para ele publicar essa, esse prefixo. We will have to publish this prefix, 200 to 32. Agora vamos ver lá no roteador 65 mil. 65,000. Esse prefixo lá. Let's see if we had reached that prefix 2001-200-32 from AS-248. Pertencente a um outro ASN. Então, você não poderia estar passando... It belongs to a different ENS. And if you analyze the RIB table here for routing, 201 slash 32 is not here. The router, knowing that it's an invalid route, it's not going to add that for you to show information with the router. So it's a prefix stealing. So it's invalid. And it's not going to be part of your routing table. So as you can see, the router is making all the right checking, validating when it's valid, setting as unknown. If there is no ROI published, and if there is an ROI published for a different ESL, then it is setting it up as invalid. Now, there is a different situation here, two situations rather. If we check once again, here, the information of ASN 22548, we are going to say that it goes from slash 32 to a maximum prefix of 48. What if our router 22548 sends a route slash 35 between 32 and 48? Will it work? Theoretically, it should work. It should set it as a valid route. But will it really happen? I am going to make the necessary changes for it to happen here, and then I'll be right back to run the test. So, back we are. So, let's see. Show, running, config. I have changed the network interface to 2001-12-FF1-35. It was 32 first. And in my BGP config, I ask it to send another router, 2001-12-FF-35. It's between 32 and 48, which is the minimum and maximum 
published in our ROI. In the router 65,000, let's see if it's going to accept the prefix as something valid. Show BGP IPv6 unicast. And here we can see that the router has set it as a valid prefix. As you can see here, it's validated. Let's check it in Cloudflare website. 2001, 12FF, slash 35, ASN 22548, valid. As it's between the minimum prefix, slash 32, and the maximum 48, it's a valid prefix. What if it's an even more specific one than slash 48? Will it accept it or not? So let's see the test here. Preparing the environment, and we'll go into the next tutorial. So let's see once again. Running config. Agora. Now the prefix is slash 50. To have a more specific one than slash 48, which is part of our ROI. And here we have BGP. So, slash 50. So, let's see router 65,000 here and see if it accepts that. Show BGP IPv6 unicast. No, does not accept that as being valid. It's invalid because it's more specific than slash 48. Please re realize how it works because sometimes it's even your prefix. You own it in your BGP. But if you are using our PKI and you do not publish the ROI with the specific prefix, it's going to set it as invalid, even though it's valid for you. It exists and you are using it, but if you don't have an ROI published, and that may cause problems to you. So please pay attention to make sure that you are publishing the right element. So this has been our tutorial and the validation, RTR, with our router. We've tested different possibilities to show you that it works. If you run the right uh, configurations, you're going to have a safer uh, network. You are going to know of the prefixes that get to your server. And it's important for you to know how to publish ROI so that you can really make sure that the networks are running appropriately so that you don't have prefix just uh, stopped to run because they are invalid. And finally, Anderson is going to show you how you can get this information about ROI in a better way, right? Easier to visualize through Grafana. Thank you all very much for your attention this morning. And now, Anderson, Wanderson. Thank you, Lucas. Okay, now I'll carry on with the tutorial. I'm Wanderson, and I'm going to show you how to configure a basic monitoring system for Go RTR that were set up by Lucas. Monitoring of Octo PRR and uh, RER are optional, but it's recommended that you have some kind of uh, monitoring tools for this. Uh, system, even though it's minimum monitoring. We are using here an example available to you. In GitHub of Cloudflare, RPI, uh, PKI validator. So there is here a folder called Compose. And here you can see all the setup files that can be used to start monitoring 
of the validation, which had been previously set up. Let me go back here. Here we are going to use a second machine, a second virtual machine called Grafana. So we have go to BTR. As Lucas has previously shown you. Let me open the uh, IVM here for you. For monitoring reasons, we are going to use two tools, Prometheus and Grafana. Prometheus is a monitoring system and also a warning open source system, and it's widely used by the DevOps community. It's important to point out that Octo, PRK, and GoTR they serve as bridges, they have metrics, and the endpoints can be used by Prometheus. Let's take a look at those two endpoints based on this element here. I'm going to open the browser, and I'm going to access here the address of the server where OctoPRKI and uh, GoPRT are being run. So here we have the number. And for Octo PRKI, for the endpoint where we can see the metrics, it's 8081, the port, and metrics. So we can see here all these metrics, all the statistics, and it's exactly a format that can be understood by Prometheus and the point-to-point -point of Go RTR, same IP address. The only difference, it's the port. Rather than being 8081, it's going to be 8080. And here, we can see, once again, the metrics that are going to be used by Prometheus. So let me go back here. After Prometheus has got those metrics, they insert them on the database and they inform the date of the query. And then we have the Grafana config, which is an open source software where we may visualize and perform data analysis. Data that was acquired by Prometheus Grafana will help us to access Prometheus database. And the first step is to install Docker Composer. So I have the Docker and the Docker Composer running here. And second, we have to download the config files from the composer. And then you may download the complete files. I have done that before. So I have downloaded all the files beforehand. And the config files, they are available already. Next step is to config Prometheus so they know exactly where to look for the metrics. And then we'll be able to edit the file prometheus.mhtml. Here, a, I have a target and the Go RTR. Go RTR, yes. Here we have the server, IP 192.168.0.114. This is the port 8080. Next step is to configure the Octo PRKI, which is under the same IP address. 
Vou salvar este arquivo. 1.114. I have to save it. E eu vou salvar isso aqui. Depois que eu salvei isso aqui, pessoal, o, a, o próximo passo é a gente... Uh, Next step. Rodar, né, o Docker Composer. O Docker Composer. Then we have to run the Docker Composer. Que vocês uh, estão utilizando, né, lá os arquivos de configuração. Então, ele já traz para vocês... Uh, the config files shows both containers, the Prometheus as well as Grafana. There are some uh, preset apps, so I just have to run the doc compose. Docker compose up minus D. And let's not forget that for such a command, you have to be at compose file or at those files where you had saved your config files. Docker compose up minus D. That will allow us to upload both tools, each one of them in a separated container. Next, we will open our browser and we'll access the local host where Grafana is being executed. Local host, here Grafana is uploaded into the 3000 door. Admin, admin by default, which is what we would advise to change that one. And then we have the Grafana running. If you apply the config uh, files available by Cloudflare, you may see a prior, prior dashboard, the prior config dashboard. There is no reason to worry or whatsoever. So once I click in, I am I'm able to see some data of those uh, metrics, such as number of rows in IPv4, number of rows in IPv6, how many clients are connected. So here in this case, we have a router that is a client for the RDR server. Here we have some additional information of queries and the roles information by the Taos, LACNIC, ERIN, ARCNIC. Here the last time that this has been validated some additional metrics and some endpoints that we see at the metrics. And then we have to follow the past five minutes or the past 30 minutes. We haven't got much coupled here. More data should be running here so we can get further information. Data should be updated at Grafana's dashboard every 10 or 30 seconds. Here I may add some additional charts, panels, and change the dashboard. You may start from scratch. And you are able to create a dashboard or even templates, which are usually made available by the companies, by the manufacturers. 
Se a gente entrar aqui, por exemplo, no, no grafana.com, certo? Grafana.com. Ah, eu posso colocar aqui, por exemplo, ó, opto. I may type ah, opton. R-P-K-I. Ah, octo, octo. RPKA. E aqui no octo RPKI, olha. And in the octo RPKI. Eu tenho, por exemplo, esse, esse template aqui. I have a template. Esse template, né? Que já... Which is the same one that we have by default at Grafana. And the config files were made available by them. But if you would make Grafana, you could use that template. So here you could copy the ID 12501 I go back to Grafana eu volto aqui no Grafana e eu posso vir aqui no botãozinho de mais and I press this plus button import as alterações que eu fiz Aí aqui eu posso colocar o... o Then I may have 12, 12, 501, which is the template ID. And then I have a dashboard with that same very name. So I just put here 01. Here I choose what is going to be the database. Where am I going to get that? to populate the dashboard. This is an information which should also be set up, set up. But as I have the template available by the Cloud Play, that has been done automatically. Now I can cut and the same template, fine. But if I go back in Manager, let me first save this dashboard. I may see both dashboards, the one automatically and the one that I had just imported. Is that right? Then I can get back and just follow all the required information. In the past minutes, I got some information and what we can take out of that. That's it for now. We have reached the final part of this tutorial. And let me thank you all for your participation. All the best and hope to see you soon. Bye. <laughs> Hope you have enjoyed so far. We are very late. We are running dangerously late with time and presentation because we were expected to close at 12, but we haven't got to the Q&A yet. And just so many interesting questions have been sent to us. So what we are going to ask you whether we can stay a little longer. We are probably going to stay as long as 12.30 for the tutorial. Now I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask all our speakers to have the all our speakers to open their cameras and then you're going to be seen here on the YouTube screen so that we can start our Q&A session. I think we have them all, right? Carlos, Carlos, are you still there? I don't know if I can see you all. We have Wanderson, Alex, Philip, Lucas. I'm not going, and Guillermo, I'm not going to go question after question. We have a summary of all questions. 
I believe that this is going to cover most of the points that had been asked. There are some questions that we had already prepared uh, thanks to discussion with other providers. And please uh, do not forget that in the afternoon we have a virtual show, right? And you can join them and Lucas and Anderson are going to be there so you can talk to them. So I hope other of our panelists can also join us in the afternoon. If you cannot, it's okay. Don't worry. You are all invited at least to join us in the afternoon. So the first round of questions and then it Eduardo will uh, jump in and ask his as well. And we can follow the same order. Philip goes first, talking about the uh, uh, ripe validator. Maybe all, not all questions will be applicable to all of you, right? Or to Wanderson and Lucas. Maybe you don't have answers for all the different questions, but you are invited to make general comments as well about validators and general situation. Of course, your experience is most welcome. Your comments are all welcome. First question. Does your validator have a production quality? Can be used by providers ESP in production to validate? Philippi? My answer is short. No. As I told you in my presentation, we discontinued our validator. So please, if you are using it, stop using and migrate to any of the other validators you've heard today. Ford, Octa, or Rotinator. Uh, Alex. Alex? Um, uh, wait, yeah. Not muting is better. Uh, yeah, absolutely use it in production. We have uh, currently six people on our RPKI uh, team uh, working on routing security. Uh, and uh, yeah, Routinator is a product that is uh, continuously being developed and improved. Uh, we try to do releases every four to six weeks. Um, we, we have production installations all over the world with uh, the, the largest organizations up to the smallest ones using our software. So yes, absolutely, use it in production. That's what it's made for. Guillermo? Yes, actually, in our case, Ford, it's a, well, a validator that is being, that is under production, is being maintained by Mexico in the software team. And it's being used by, uh, yeah, also many sites in the region, many different sites in the region, and uh, there are also many deployments and the traffic exchange points in the region and uh, peace. And, well, yes, I would say that it is under production at the moment and can be accessed in GitHub. There is another question. Oops. <laughs> well, uh, Lucas is going to answer. Based on what we've tested with OctoPRKI, some recent versions have been released of all the tasks we've run. It worked quite okay. In the tutorial that we presented to you, there was some portion about auto-validation of the router, and we've noticed that in Cisco routers, there is the option of deactivated auto-validation. So then you can do it yourself using route map. Because if you do not validate it manually, sometimes there might be problems with routing. But this is something that we've noticed in the iOS systems, but nothing involving the tool per se. Based on our tests, it can be used for production as well. You see, I think that based on the test we've run, we've seen that there has been constant releases. There are recent versions, updated versions, but we haven't tested in production ourselves, right? Because 
we are not one of the developers of the tools, of course. But based on what we've done with it, it proved to be very powerful. Eduardo? Well, there is one more question here related to production environment, and I'd like to know whether there is anything that should be taken into consideration when installing a validator, anything that should be taken care of, any specific uh, uh, file, should it be in the network closer to router? Tell us more about that, exactly where. Felipe, comments from your side? I think it's related to the question whether it should run in cloud or not, and the recommendation is not to do it. The closer to the router, the better, because there is an issue of uh, confidence, really. But uh, I think that's that's how I would like to add. Alex, would you like to make any comments along these lines? Yeah, so practically what you would need to take care of is make sure that uh, on your firewall, the outgoing ports for rsync and HTTPS, so 873 and 443 are open. And those are really the only two operational requirements to uh, run software like this. Uh, with regards to um, having a third party validator, uh, so running a validator or having a validator that is run by somebody else, and connecting to that to use your uh, to to use the validated data for your routers, uh, that is really not recommended. It it's quite as you've seen in all of these demos. It's quite easy and quite simple, uh, and it has minimal requirements to set up RPKI validation yourself. Um, when you rely on a third party, you don't actually do the cryptographic validation yourself. You don't know whether you have all of the data. You cannot install any monitoring on this. Um, and to connect your routers to something that is running somewhere on the internet, run by somebody else, uh, you don't know whether you're getting all of the data, whether there's an outage, whether there's a problem. Um, but it does affect something that is happening on your routers. So by all means, install RPKI Validator yourself on your own machine, install it close to your router. It is really very simple, and there's no reason to outsource validation to a third party. Thank you. Guillermo, anything from your side? As a special consideration of these validators, well, we have to th think about the trust anchors to download the trust, trust anchors. This is an important part in order to start the validation and all the cryptographic verification depends on this and we sometimes you have to accept an agreement each validator has a different way of doing it nonetheless this is a step that we must take into account and alex and felipe have already commented on this and i totally agree with all of their recommendations Great, thank you. Lucas, anything? Or Wanderson? Well, totally agree with Felipe, Guillermo, and Alex. It's very easy to do. Installation is very easy. Configuration is easy as well. So just leave it close to your router. It does not make any sense having it validated outside, right? Uh, there are a number of problems that may happen, and you end up having your uh, network not fully in operation. So run it in your network and as close to the router as possible. And as Alex said, do not outsource this function. It makes no sense, right? Just uh, uh, just do it yourself and it's going to be great. I think we can go into the next question. Okay, Wonderson. It's still along a similar topic. Um, several people over the chat mention about different types of routers which they allow now to run containers. 
containers may run within the router itself. Uh, Jupyter, Microtik, uh, Microtik, they all allow to run a container over Linux with a dock or something similar to that. And some uh, even uh, consider to run that over the container. What is your take on that? Does that sound as a good idea or not? And why, Philip? I haven't got much experience with container, but I, my opinion is that we shouldn't do that. But let's hear our other colleagues and see what they think about that. Alex? So um, I would say that your router, uh, you would want all of the resources, all of the memory and all of the CPU power that it has available to use that for uh, actually dealing with uh, rip in and rip out and actually routing and not be preoccupied with doing cryptographic validation of, of objects published by a third party. Uh, in addition, if you uh, have a specific router and you install RPKI validation software on that router, then you're only doing it for one box you're actually much better off installing a validator on a separate box and then have multiple routers within your network connect to this one instance. It's a much more efficient use of resources. Um, our tests have shown that you can connect up to 100 or even 200 routers to a single Routinator instance. And I'm pretty sure that that would apply to all of the other implementations as well. So it's really inefficient to have it installed on each and every router in, in that sense. So if, if it were my network, I would always recommend to spend the resources uh, and, and the CPU power and the memory that the router has on what it's supposed to do in its core function. I totally agree with Alex. I do not like that. The idea of installing an RPK and RPKI validator in the right in the router, we have to differentiate things. I totally agree with Alex, you know. Otherwise, we would have to install in each router a validator. So here we're talking about installing 12 because of redundancy, routinator and fort. These are validators that should be installed parallelly. And we, we would have to install this in each router where we would like to do a variation. It would be a better idea to have them in a server and for the routers to connect to the server. And things will work better. And what Alex said as well, each team, you know, the router routes and the variator should be inside a server. Well, you can do it, right? But it is possible. It is feasible. But I don't know if it's recommendable, okay? Lucas? Eu acho que eu concordo com o que o Alex e o Guilherme disseram, né? É melhor deixar as coisas separadas ali. I agree. We better split things. That's possible, but why should you? I don't know if there is any new, real need for that, right? So, any additional comment, Wanderson? Yes, exactly. Well, to if you have to perform a number of different uh, functions, you have to try to perform them as good as possible. So let's let the server be responsible to the whole validation. And the other one just works with router, you know, let's do whatever each one can do fine. Uh, each one should perform what they are good at. So with hum unanimous here, everyone seems to agree that is not a good idea to run 
together, but rather to run in a separate framework, not over the cloud, but within your provider framework, close to the providers. One single redundant structure may serve several routers. Eduardo? Is it worthwhile having just one validator at the network or multiple validators? Or to have diversity, to have the fourth, the, the routinator or RPKI? And how do they deal with that information? Should you have set up a primary, a secondary, or you divide the load among the two routers? I'd like now to uh, invite Felipe to compliment. Does it make sense to use one, two, or more? Does it make any sense at all or not? Best practices. I think two would be ideal. Maybe conflict. I don't know. Let's see. Tá certo. Alex, fica à vontade. Am I up? Yeah, okay. So, uh, absolutely, run multiple. Um, uh, and if you can, if you want to run multiple implementations, so I have different vendors uh, within your network, that is a good idea as well. Look, if everybody follows the standards, uh, and most implementations do, the resulting data set is going to be exactly the same. The only differences that you may see is because of timing. So uh, every validator runs at a certain interval. Uh, there's drilling going on. If you hear drilling, I'm very sorry. Um, um, so uh, because every validator runs at a certain interval, you may have fetched a ROA that the other validator has not yet fetched because, because of a timing thing. And these small differences may be, may be the only thing that you notice. Uh, for the rest, it's highly recommended to run multiple validators for redundancy. Tá certo, obrigado, Alex. Guilherme. Thanks, Alex. Guilherme. I totally agree. And for instance, many of the team, many of the XPs that are emerging in the region are installing parallelly Optinator and Fort. And they're using this. You know that in order to certify the, they have to use that, they have to show that they use RPKI. Many of the teams are certifying manners in, an, in a region, and for this, they are installing a validator and the route server. And with this, they are working with Routinator and Ford in parallel. I think that this is a good practice. I, people could do this more and more, and as Alex said, this is, this is software that follows a certain standard, so the router, so you can receive information from the different validators. Uh, something that is worthwhile mentioning on this is that to have different validators from different from different vendors have, have allowed um, different things to emerge in LACNOC. So sometimes the validation process is not exactly the same and we have to correct this. So we have seen differences throughout time. This is why it is interesting to work with different validation architectures. Lucas and Anderson, I agree. I think we should have two different implementations of validation. We haven't uh, 
carried out any tests to see differences, but that is a the fall. So there is not much divergence. It's just time. Maybe one will pull faster than the than the other. So we might have a row of validation faster than another one. But in terms of redundancy, if you have one, you have none. So you better have at least two in your network. Oh, yes, I definitely agree. I haven't much more to add. Redundance is always mostly welcome. So, so far, we have a consensus that we have to install validators within the infrastructure of ISP, of the organization of the provider, preferably specific servers to that purpose that will meet a number of routers and not to make use of third-party information, neither to place that on the cloud. And ideally, we should have a redundancy and more than one installed router. My next question is still along the same lines. Why should we choose or how should we choose? It seems that we have at least three validator feasible options, fourth routinator and uh, octo RPKI, three options. Why should we choose one of them? What are their advantages? When should we choose one or another? Any specific dif uh, difference between one to another? Or it doesn't make any difference at all? I'd like to hear your opinion. Maybe Philip could uh, give us an overview and others could talk about uh, the specific ones. You have the floor, Felipe. The uh, maturity level, how ripe that uh, uh, system is, we use in our server the RIPnet internally, one of the, the RIP NCC. I know that Fort also has a quite a high level of maturity, but there are some other options such as the RPKI client. I'll try to be neutral here considering my position. I have to keep my disclosures here, but this is the reality. Um, so basically, um, Routinator has uh, 22 contributors. We've had 44 releases. Uh, this is our day job. This is what we do. Uh, we we have been an open source development company since 1999. Uh, making liberally licensed open source software is our core business. Um, we offer paid support. Uh, yeah, I, 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 this is the best reason why you should use Routinator. It, it is what we do. Um, and uh, yeah, with regards to using multiple vendor implementations, I, I want to add one thing. I mean, we've had a long history also with, for example, our DNS software. And I've read in the chat today that also with regards to using DNS software, uh, it's very common to use multiple implementations within your infrastructure. And if you look at the way that, that we as an organization also cooperate with other DNS vendors, uh, such as the makers of Bind and PowerDNS and Not Resolver, uh, to make sure that all of them work cohesively within one environment. We strive to do the exact same thing with our RPKI software. We 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 try to work together with within the ITF uh, to work on standards, standards development, uh, standards adherence, uh, and we try to make the software as good and robust. Uh, not just for ourselves, but for everyone. Um, so that's also why I said that if you use the software from another vendor, you can expect to get the same result. 
It is what fits best within your infrastructure and what you feel is the best for your organization. I can only vouch for sort of what we make and, and something that we're very proud of. But if you feel that another solution is better for you, then go right ahead. Everything is open source and everything is liberally licensed. It's completely free. So it's up to you. Guillermo. Sí, este, bueno, de acuerdo que la elección. I eh, agree that that all of these softwares are open source. What we would highlight in Fort would be is that it's efficient. It's a software. It is written in C language, so this is why it is very efficient to run. It doesn't use much memory. So as it consumes little resources, it makes it easy for it to be deployed in virtual machines and in servers that don't have many resources. And the products product is maintained. It's updated with regarding bugs and, uh, and support updates. Therefore, we are, it is, it, we incorporate. There's like a cycle of the incorporation of new features or IRFs, and then we discuss which will be deployed and which not. Nonetheless, we incorporate them as new features are incorporated, like the use, like our PK didn't exist. So all of those are supported. Nothing to add. I think Alex and Guillermo are just much more ahead of us. So we totally agree. When there are a lot of tools that offer some kind of service, usually as a consumer, I'm going to choose the one that offers some advantages, even though they are minor advantages compared to others. Sometimes because there is better uh, customer service, a better response to my requests or requests, or someone who offered a better graphic interface. So in terms of offering services, we know all of them are going to offer good services, fine. But we tend to choose the one with which, you know, we feel different, something that seems to offer us a little bit more. I think that's the idea. I don't think one is superior or better than the other. I really think we just have to try to identify which are the ones that really cater for our needs, so to speak. Well, we are coming to the end of our life. I'm just going to ask you for a round of uh, conclusions and also hear about the ad adoption of uh, RPKI in your region. We have people from Europe and other countries. So I would like to hear how are people uh, adopting RPKI and what is the adoption Option in terms of configuration for ROIs, uh, invalid ROIs. Are people just disposing them if they are unknown ROIs? What are they doing with that? Are they just working with preferences? So let me hear you um, on that. What is your experience on it? So, Felipe, would you like to make your closing comments and then we are going to come to the end? Philippe and the others, of course. In terms of deployment of um, uh, root origin validation, the May Q1 providers have deployed them. I don't have exact data to share with you, but that's something that I can check and get back to you. Concerning the coverage of ROIs, I just got the numbers. Here in the Netherlands, we had 80% of our PV4 prefix covered by ROI. In France, 77%, Germany, 75%, Portugal, 94%, so very high number. In Brazil, or there in Brazil, 
The number is still low, 5% only. In Uruguay, 90%. Maybe Guillermo and Carlos can add on it. Concerning invalid, um, I would have to go over that in details, but I was just browsing through it, and it seems that it's close to zero number of invalid. I'm going to send you a link through the chat where you can have access to the numbers. Great, thank you. Alex, would you like to say anything about that? Because um, you used to have the world map, right, with all the information, and people said, where is the map? Oh, yeah, well, no, I'm so sorry, everything. I'm so sorry. So, uh, yeah, we were migrate. The, the map broke, and then we wanted to migrate the map into our other tool set called JDR. Uh, JDR is meant uh, for, for complete analysis of all RPKI data. Uh, and uh, the, the time between one map breaking and us integrating it into JDR took a little bit longer than we wanted. But luckily, the right thing to see has a similar map uh, which shows you the deployment level. The only thing missing there is IPv6 information. But uh, it's it's a work in progress. I'm I'm very sorry. Um, with regards to deployment in general, I think something that you have to take into account is the fact that uh, many of the tier one networks, so, so Telia, AT&T, level three communications, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they all drop RPKI invalids nowadays. And the chances of your traffic passing through one of these tier ones uh, is actually rather large if you use the internet. Usually, this is one or two hops away. So, uh, the, you get a huge halo effect uh, from the fact that these tier ones are doing that, uh, offering us a lot of protection from RPKI uh, or, or from BGP hijacking uh, today because of uh, uh, inadvertent uh, BGP uh, announcements that are RPKI invalid. Um, that doesn't mean that as an, uh, a more local organization, as an ISP, you shouldn't invest in uh, dropping RPKI invalids. If you're more towards the edge of the network, there's still a lot of value in doing it. And uh, you see now that all of the router implementations are very mature. Uh, there's ample choice of RPKI validation. There's a lot of documentation available on how to do it. And there are several communities. So there's mailing lists, Discord servers, uh, et cetera, et cetera, where people come together and discuss these topics. I mean, this event in itself is already a good example of that. So with all of this operational experience, I think people feel very safe and very secure in actually deploying RPKI. Uh, um, not just publishing a ROA, but also taking the next step and dropping invalids themselves. Um, it's it's really where the, where uh, the industry is going. And as we're doing that, we're at the cross points now where we're all doing BGP origin validation. So uh, the the origin itself. Uh, um, it is something that is protected, but what everyone is asking for is full BGP path validation. And this is something where we as an industry are now going, uh, that, that we're going to be looking at maybe not full BGP sec, but smaller ways of making a statement about who your upstream providers are and who your adjacent ASs are and making statements about that and making sure that you can validate those. So this is where the industry is going. And I think just deployment is just super encouraging. If you want to have a look at um, uh, which networks are currently dropping RPKI invalids, Cloudflare is compiling a list on isbgpsafeyet.com. Have a look at that. Obrigado. Guillermo? Well, I would like to take this opportunity to share this link with you where you can find more information. Just a moment, please. Hold on. I won't actually get to, into details because we have to wrap up, but this is where you can find the deployment for ROAS for prefixes that were announced last month on this website. 
bear in mind, it's not for the available addresses, but what's announced in BGP, the region. For This is for Latin America, the Caribbean. So you have 35% of prefixes covered by ROA. You see the evolution, a map, IPv4 and IPv6, results of the variation, which prefixes are valid, not found, not valid. So 5%. Potential breaches. What is in our PKI and RR? So you can all actually take a closer look at this. There's also a map. You can see, look at the colors. This is called the Ford monitoring system. I hope it's useful. And well, I, I know we have to close, so this will be all for now. We have no more time left, and I'd like to name our sponsors. He is naming the sponsors. See, Collage Back, Fibic, Global Netflix, and the support of Media, RTI, and Telecom. Moreiras, shall you, you close, please? I would like to deeply thank you, Guillermo, Carlos, Alex, Anderson, Lucas, Lacnic guys who recorded their video. Thank you so much for your attendance today. I know that we were running a bit late, but thank you for following the chat to answer all the questions. It was amazing. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure that those that followed us in the live link have also learned a lot. We have everything recorded in Portuguese, English, and Spanish, and that will be a, an excellent reference material, not only for those who had followed us lively, but those that will search later to solve their uh, questions and doubts. On behalf of the technical Brazilian community, I would like to thank you so much, as well as our technical internal team and everyone at the chat. So don't miss our virtual exhibition fair, which will start at 2 p.m. So search for our website with the whole agenda. We will have our sponsors booth. Eduardo has just thanked our dear sponsors. We're going to have a number of takeaways, a number of things to be given away. So please come visit. Let's know network, let's meet new people. I'm sure that it's going to be great. If you show up, I'm sure that you will not regret. If you join us at 2 p.m., I'm sure that you're going to stick until the virtual room will be closed. So please, camera on, mic on, and let's chat. That will be a great experience, just as if you were on a uh, site event. Thank you once again. And this event is officially closed now. This live is no longer being broadcasted. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye, Alex.